Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome. Um, welcome, Vivian. Um, thank you very much for this um, wonderful occasion. First of all, thank you for your book, um, which is a moving book, an important book. Uh, but before I get to it, I want to thank Gal. Thank you for asking me to come, inviting me, and for putting this all together. Um, this is a wonderful book. It's a very rich book. Um, highly recommended. <clears throat> um, I'd like to begin, first of all, with, um, with two points of what I learned from the book. I think, uh, basically, what I'm going to speak this evening is to make a distinction between the micro level of this book and the macro level of this book. And, and I'm going to push you on this and going to invite you to speak some more about it, OK? On the micro level, the book, first of all, has um, wonderfully poignant readings of, um, of Hannah Arendt, of Giorgio Agamben, of Selan, um, of Sholem, of Benjamin, and of Kafka, of course. And, and many, many nuggets. I want to begin with reading one that resonated for me personally very strongly, um, a passage from Kafka I didn't know. And um, whoever has once experienced near death can tell terrifying things about it. But how it is after death, that he cannot say. Not even being close to death than anyone else, he has merely lived something exceptional. And it is not this exceptional, but common life that has become more valuable to him. Um, this is how I felt when I came home from war and what I took for myself. Um, this is how I live my life. I've tried to live my life this way, of um, learning that common life is something crucial, something important, something wor worth making an effort to make possible um, and, uh, um, and inseparable from the effort to make this a world in which there's less suffering. And um, being, uh, being a religious person myself, what Kafka, Kafka continues to say even continues to resonate for me. It is the same with everyone who has experienced something ex exceptional. Moses, for example certainly experienced something extraordinary on Mount Sinai. But rather than surrendering to this exceptional experience, he rushed down the mountain and had valuable things to tell and loved the humans to whom he fled even more than before. Um, this is how I've tried to teach Torah as well and wisdom here in the academy. So first of all, thank you. This is, this is wonderful. These are one of the things that you hope to find in every book that you read is something that touches you. Um, the second thing that I took personally was um, uh, I think there's um, a very sensitive unraveling of, of Walter Benjamin's notion of pure language. Uh, this is something I've always found very, very difficult. I think Benjamin's account of language is completely wrong, um, and yet, um, something in him is profoundly challenging. And having the chance of, um, of revisiting, I don't think Benjamin uh, puts it in these words, but actually questioning the gap between being and meaning. Um, I think there's no one who poses it that way. And one of the things I learned from your book was to treat pure language not, not so pure. And that's where I, I fell in the trap, but as a construct for thinking about this gap. And you do it remarkably. In many, many small passages along the way, um, I found it very, uh, very deft, very sensitive, and personally f learned a lot from it. Um, so thank you on those levels. And, th and those are the kind of markers of micro things that you pick up when you read a book this, this rich. However, what was most troubling for me in the book is is what I call the gap between the micro and the macro. And I want to try 
to explain the question, and that's what I'll devote the minutes I have to, to pose a question, hopefully pose it in a meaningful and a challenging way that, you know, that you'll want to uh, pick up the gauntlet when, um, uh, in your own remarks. And perhaps a good place to begin is by, um, is by actually returning to, to, to Heidegger. And I think one of Heidegger's great contributions um, in his work um, after Seinenzeit is, is articulating the issue of ontotheology and understanding the crisis of Western metaphysics as the collapse of the ontotheological model and paradigm. Um, he does this in a number of places. First of all, in, in his amazing essays on Nietzsche, uh, in which he leads us from understanding Nietzsche as a cultural critic to understand Nietzsche as a crucial philosopher of late modernity, of one who understands the tremendous price uh, the price tag of modernity, um, and uh, the first important articulation of the collapse of the ontotheological um, model, and its its powerful expression in um, in 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 a theology of negativity, a theology of the death uh, of of the death of God. Um, this is an experience that has been crucial. Um, to, um, to Jews and to all human beings in the 20th century, um, when we see the amount of slaughter that the secular state has done in the world, in Europe first and from there on to the world itself, and we look at, um, and, and we look and, and we stand staggered and, and we re-experience um, the death of God yet again. Yet, in Heidegger's work itself, this does not spell the end of theology. It is understood by Heidegger, who doesn't pick up on this as a possibility for himself, but certainly points to it, that what this necessitates is a new kind of theology, a new kind of theological thinking. Um, it's this cue that I've taken for my own work um, um, now um, turning 60. This is, this, is, this is what I think about. Um, I found myself returning to theology and learning how to return through the to theology through these questions. And actually, when um, I like to tell my students, and, and this week, in, in, in this week's Torah portion of reading, it actually, the Torah actually speaks about it. Uh, um, God says to Moses, I showed myself, I revealed myself onto, the, um, onto Abraham by the name of El Shaddai, but my name of the Tetragameton, Hashem, I did not I did not make known to him. And this is a very strange verse because anyone who reads the Bible can see that part of Abraham's call to the world is done through the Tetragameton. Now, I take this to mean that really, from the point of view of Moses, from the kind of revelation that he sees, what Abraham thought was God was not God in a very important way, or a very restricted notion of it. It's in this sense as a theologian that I also approach the Heideggerian and the Nietzschean moment. And I see this as something in the picture of God that we had before can't work anymore. And we need to articulate this anew. And this I see as part of my own task. But one of the reasons that I'm raising this here is because I think that the new theological turn of the late 20th century of post-World War II and entering in the 21st century also raises new possibilities of canonicity. It's not, not, metaphysics does not take the only place or even the primary one 
in determining what is a relevant canon. And I think the way I look at Vivian's book is if Vivian has chosen a theological canon, and that theological canon is made up of the people, of, of the heroes of the book that I just mentioned. This is the canon. Now, to be sure, it's a very specific canon. As she says at the opening of the book, this is at the critical moment in German Jewish uh, um, uh, thought, not of the normative moment. And, and that's an interesting choice, and I'm going to question it in, in a moment. But, I, but first of all, I think what we discover here is that theological reflection has a much richer canon in terms of reflecting on human experience, on reflecting on the world, on, the reflect, on the reflecting on the, on the meeting or the possible meeting between human beings and divine otherness than metaphysical texts. Now, I think that this is what enables you to choose your text, but I, I don't think you're willing to go far enough with that in the book. What do I mean? When I say that I think there's a gap between the micro and the macro is that on the level of the macro, um, Vivian is very clear about what it is she does not want. And, and, uh, and let me explain. If one of the important um, um, implications of the theological moment is appropriating a new canon, and Kafka, for example, is a crucial um, a player in this. Celan, for me, certainly is a crucial player in, in, uh, in this. I see Celan as the important Jewish poet of the, um, of the second half of the 20th century. And, um, and it, most especially, both of them, um, in the fact that they write in German, um, which is a haunting language, for um, from where I speak. The second, <clears throat> um, so this is this is one important point. The um, the second point is that when we approach these materials and we are not sufficiently theologically attuned, we fall into traps. What do I mean? The important other notion to Heidegger's notion of ontotheology is Carl Schmitt's notion of political theology. It's because of the collapse of the ontotheological picture that the question whether any theology is not anything but political theology and whether any politics is not but political theology becomes a crucial one because there is no point of judgment. And um, not understanding this connection risks returning to former errors. And I think that this is one of the main points of the book, that when you have people like Joshua Agamben or others that are mentioned in the book, that return to the Paulinian moment as a continuation of the critical moment of Jewish Weimar, what they do without being sufficiently theologically self-aware is repeat Christian supersessionist arguments. And this creates an amazing paradox. The Catholic Church made the most amazing effort in Vatican II to rethink Catholicism, and suddenly you find an Italian like Agamben being pre-Vatican II more than the Catholic Church in his supersessionist thought. Um, this, is, um, this is extremely problematic, to say the least. And I think portrays a moment of lack of self-reflection of what it means to make use of theological tradition without properly understanding its genealogy. So I think that this point is made very forcefully in the book. However, Vivian does not tell us in the book what it is that she does want. What is a critical, uh, what does it mean 
to embrace this critical tradition for us today. Now, this is also the point that Galili pushed you on, if I understand, in your opening remarks also. What, what would it look like? What are we looking for? Why have you opted for them and not opted for the normative tradition, for example, um, which is uh, um, um, doesn't lack its own critical self-awareness. So this is one part of the question, but let me, let me add another dimension to it. The other dimension to it is that when we look at the book theologically, the thematics of redemption, law, and exile stand out as crucial and fundamental elements of any possible Jewish theology. Um, which I agree with. I think that, these, that, that you have to give some kind of account of them, whatever it's going to be. These are part of the elements, uh, the thematics you'll have to deal with. Now, interestingly, when you come to deal with exile, you constantly um, adopt Gershom Sholem's position that exile is life and deferral. And I want to ask why adopt Sholem's position on that? Um, this is, this is, I think, a completely misguided understanding of the meaning of exile. I think the no, and and here there's an interesting tension in I think in Sholem's work. I think contrary. Here I agree with you. Contrary to Moshe Idel, I believe that Sholem's reading of of the Ari of Luria and the Lurianic Kabbalah is correct. Um, I think it is a theology of Galut and a, um, a, a profound and frightening one. I think that the notion of the breaking of the vessels of Shvirat Kilim is an accurate portrayal of the world we live in. We live in a world of broken vessels. But if we live in a broken vessels, a world of broken vessels, this is not deferral. This is life. This is where we live. And now the question is, what are we going to do with it? What we do with it? What are the possibilities of tikkun? And what are the possibilities of tohu, of chaos in this world? These are, these are crucial questions. But this is not about deferral. This is, what, this is about life. And what is life, a life of a person posturing herself or himself before God in a post onto theological moment, what would this possibly mean? There's one place where I think you, you hint at where you would go, which I think uh, I would resonates for a certain way with me as well. And in a curious way, was also raised by life in a certain way in our previous seminar. And this actually appears on another page, um, um, a couple of page Onwards, when you, you speak about Agamben's messianism modeled on the Apostle Paul, focuses on the abrog abrogation of the existing order in view of an event, the coming of Christ, that has already happened and that has transformed the present into a time that remains. Sholem's melancholic view of history and his bleak interpretation of Benjamin's angel seem, in Agamben's eyes, a paradigmatic example of the paralyzed messianism that he rejects in all notions of history and politics that are oriented to the idea of an infinite task. Now this phrasing is a fascinating one because basically Agamben is, is accusing Sholem of really being a good student of Hellman Cohen. I think one of Cohen's profoundest ideas is that human existence is an, on an asymptotic curve towards the deity. Now, this is not a life in deferral. So in a funny way, now, I think if I had to guess, I think that this is what you would espouse. It's close to what I would espouse as well. But I would deny that this is a life in deferral. And I think that Sholem himself was torn on this point. Um, and, uh, and as soon I don't want to speak about how I think one closes the gap between, um, between the two. I have a position on that, but that would take us elsewhere. I want to pose the question. 
do you espouse Cohen's, espouse Cohen's position? Do you think Sholem is wrong? Um, where would you go with your book? Um, why are you opting for the critical moment? What is its ongoing power? Um, my answer would be, in one line, is that it's the only way to constantly free ourselves of idolatry. But to free ourselves of idolatry does not mean that we are redeemed. Thank you.